Good morning and welcome to the 18th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone to please turn off or switch their electronic devices to silence so that they don't affect the committee's work this morning? We have apologies today from Colin Beatty and Kenneth Gibson. MSP is attending in his place. Item 1, decision on taking business in private. We have already agreed to take consideration of our draft report in private, which is item 4. Do members agree to take items 3 and 5 in private this morning? Thank you. Item 2 is the 2016-17 audit of New College Lanarkshire. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Dr Linda McTavish, CBE Chair of Lanarkshire Regional Board, Martin Maguire, Principal and Chief Executive, Ian Clark, Vice Principal Resources, Derek Small, Smeal, is that how I pronounce it? Smeal, sorry, Vice Principal Strategy and Corporate Performance from New College Lanarkshire, and Dr John Kemp, interim, uh, no, now Chief Executive, still interim Chief Executive of the Scottish Funding Council. Thank you. Can I ask uh, Dr Linda McTavish to make an opening statement, please? Thank you, convener. Um, can I thank the committee for taking the opportunity to invite us here for us to provide you with more evidence. Um, we are a region across Lanarkshire, South Lanarkshire, North Lanarkshire and Eastern Bartonshire that have consistently met our credit target since merger. We're a very large region. I've already stated three local authorities and a large population, including a significant rural base. We have a very positive relationship with the SFC and it's been very, very constructive and helpful uh, to us. We are in financial difficulties and when those difficulties came to light, we immediately examined the reasons and took steps that we could make savings and we delivered savings in 2016-17. And I think you see that in the evidence. We accept those difficulties for partly um, poor planning. But I would like to put in the record that our merger was a complicated one. It was the only two plus one merger in Scotland. It was viewed and um, assessed by the Funding Council and ourselves as being successful. But there were post-merger issues that I think we're maybe going to explore this morning and how we dealt with those uh, post-merger issues. Um, we welcome your scrutiny and ag again, we'll try to answer as best we can, but we'll supply you with any further information if necessary. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Dr McTavish. I'm going to ask Alec Neil to open questioning for the committee. Good morning, Linda. As you said, the, the challenge here in the remit of this committee is to look behind the financial challenges and to understand why they have existed and what can be done to sort them. So, obviously, there are three, I think, related big issues, strategic issues. One is the amount of credits you get, because that determines your income, uh, as well as other income. There is also the cost structure. Uh, as well as uh, uh, any grant, additional grant income that you can get from the SFC and so on. Can I concentrate just on the cost structure? Um, I've been looking at the organisational structure of the college, and what I see is seven layers of management. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the principal, Martin, three vice principals, seven assistant principals, umpteen managers in business development alone <coughs> the information I have is you've got 14 managers in business development alone then you've got six heads of faculty at least six assistant heads of faculty I think it's over 30 curriculum and quality leaders and then the lecturers who are not obviously a tier of management so I count seven tiers of management and it and if you look at business development, I just picked business development, which is one of the departments under an assistant principal. Uh, my understanding is there's four teams in that. There is the commercial business development, a total of six people with three managers. So an average of one person per manager. The regional development team has 22 people with three managers. 
Um, the external funding team has six people with three managers. Again, a ratio on average of one to one. And then catering and conferencing and accommodation, 45 people with five managers. It's just not way top heavy in terms of management, especially when some of the people who have been made redundant or, or taken severance are lecturers. And at the end of the day, the principal job of the college is the teaching aspect of its remit. Martin, do you want yeah, to? Answer that. Martin yeah. Maguire. The, um, the structure of the college um, pretty much was agreed um, at merger. Um, that went through a process whereby the, the board looked at the structure. And the structure, um, we were the last of the colleges to merge. So the, the, the structure was based on uh, other structures and other colleges. Um, I think what, what's important to remember is the size and the scale of the organisation. And you're talking about the, uh, you know, the, 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 the European team there. Um, our, um, our Erasmus contract for, for European exchange is the biggest in the UK. It's 1.6 million over the next two years. And not only is it the biggest in the UK, we actually send more students to Europe than the whole of Wales. So that there's a scale there that, that I think people have to understand. Um, and also what we have to remember is as well is that we inherited uh, through merger a lot of staff. It's not as if we've brought in a whole load of new staff. We inherited staff, um, and obviously some of them were on um, consolidated posts and fitted into these structures and whatever. So, so it's it's an operation that that, that um, you know has a turnover of 55 million um, across a wide geographical area. And as I've given you an example there of of the scale, um, I mean on our business side, also our modern apprentices, um, there was a. a there was a, a stat that came across my desk last week. Our, um, our fire and security uh, students um, won an award down south. And obviously, it hit the press because of the Grenfell um, being in the, in the news at the moment. But our fire and security department, and again, it's an example of our modern apprentices, we train more fire and security modern apprentices than the whole of England. So I think people have to understand the scale of the organisation. Dr Sorry. Kemp would like to add to that. Yeah, in, in response to some questions being raised about this, when you previously discussed um, New College Lanarkshire Section 22, we, we, we compared the, the six colleges with around a £50, 000, a 50 million pound turnover um, in Scotland for their management structures. Um, and there are, as I say, you know, several colleges roughly the same size in terms of turnover as New College Lanarkshire. And New College Lanarks is about average for the, the senior management team and the proportion of staff who are earning above 60,000. Clearly, the way that a college organises you know, the grades beneath 60,000 um, you know, will vary, but, but many of those people will be you know, teaching as well as managers and so on. Um, but we can give some reassurance that you know, New College Lanarkshire pretty much has the same um, level of senior management as any other college of the same size. They all be overmanaged in terms of uh, the layers of management. I don't think that's a very good excuse. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I know a lot of organisations with turnover far in excess of 55 million, yeah. uh, with far fewer layers of management than this. I mean, for example, what do the assistant heads of faculty do? Well, they teach for a start. Um, but also, um, because we have six uh, faculties spread across um, a wide uh, area, um, they are required at times to, to be the head of faculty as well when, when, when the head of faculty is not there on, on, on campus. Um, and again, um, it's, it's, it's the size of the organisation. Some of our faculties are bigger than other colleges in Scotland. But, I mean, you, you referred specifically to the Erasmus, the yeah. management of Erasmus. Now, that's the external funding department team. Yeah. yeah. The external funding team has only got six people, yeah. right? which is obviously enough uh -huh. to run Erasmus and the other activities it's doing, presumably. And it's got three managers, an average of one manager per person. You're not seriously telling me that that's efficient. I mean, the, the whole point here is you have to look at this from your cost structure. You're facing a major deficit situation. Clearly in the evidence from the union side, 
And, you know, reading the evidence from management and union is like re reading about two entirely different colleges because neither the twain shall meet in terms of your perception of things and their perception of things. But, you know, if people are being made redundant or, I mean, I believe that the, uh, the uh, curriculum and quality leaders have been down, their, their grades have been downgraded recently. It seems to me they're, they're pretty crucial to the quality of the delivery. But what justifies, I mean, it's no justification to come to the committee and say, well, seven layers of management are okay because everybody else does it. We, we see streams of college reports and a lot of them are in financial difficulty. And I have to say the Funding Council has a role in this as well. Maybe you need to take a more critical look at how much the overhead cost is uh, and you know, the relationship between the overhead cost and the actual resources that are going into actual teaching. As Martin knows, I was dealing with an individual case recently when we discovered that in one class there was no lecturer for eight weeks. How often does that happen? Mr Neil, is that a question to but, Mr well, Maguire? Well, both, actually, because uh, both Martin and John. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that incident that you're talking about um, was certainly something that was a surprise to me, and we've, we've reviewed that, and obviously we've, we've, we've made it, uh, the faculty's aware that that, that is not um, what we would expect. Um, Could you just pick you up there, Martin? Yeah. It's a surprise to you as the principal. You've got uh, all these layers of management, and nobody came to tell you they were running for that period of time without a lecturer. A well, course. I think... Um, the, the, in other words, with, despite all the management, mm -hmm. it's not being managed. I think, yeah, I, think that, I think the circumstances in that particular case were, were, were unique, to be honest. And, and there was cover. The fact that I, I don't think that, that, that they went for eight weeks without a lecturer. There was cover. There was a specific incident. Um, and I don't know that it's appropriate for us to, to get into the dialogue no, of it here, just, here, here just now. Uh, you made a point there about the, the curriculum quality leaders being downgraded. That, that's not the case. Um, what has happened is that um, as part of national bargaining, um, all of um, the posts have to be levelled. Um, and you're talking about the uh, assistant heads of faculty, and I think the, the last time you, you mentioned their, their, their salary. What happened is they've come in at, uh, at levelled at level three, um, and that's the appropriate level under national bargaining. Now, that goes to an independent panel who look at that. The curriculum and quality leaders um, that you're referring to, the 40-odd of them, they also um, attempted to be levelled at level three. And unfortunately, um, the panel, um, the judgment there, as far as they were concerned, was that they would remain at level two, and that's the level that they're at at the moment. So they haven't been downgraded. They have been levelled at the level that they're at at the moment through the the National Bargaining Panel. Dr McTavish. Uh, the National Bargaining Panel consists of both union and a uh, management with an independent chair, and we went and presented there. The union might not like the result of that decision, but that's the decision under national bargaining. We've gone through the correct procedures. They are upset about this, but the evidence was presented by both sides and a conclusion was reached that the levelling should be two. I can supply you the information that the panel gave in relation to those posts if you need it. Mr. Can I ask then, just in terms of this layer of management and the number of people in management, uh, I said 14 managers, according to my information, uh, 14 managers uh, in one of the assistant principals' um, empires. There's another six, six assistant principals so in total, how many managers are there reporting to the assistant principals? I'm not talking about including the heads of faculty, actual managers on the same basis as the managers I've mentioned in business development. So what's the total? I can't figure off the top of my head, but we can supply the structure. Roughly? I couldn't give you an accurate figure of that. So would the other departments have more or less than 14 it, it, each? It depends, it depends what the activity is in that particular department. So, so if the others have roughly 12 or 14 each, and you multiply that by seven, there must be nearly 100 folk at that level alone who are managers. There's over, there's over 1,000 staff in the college, spread across a wide geographical area. But if, but if you add all this up, you know, um, including assistant heads and all the rest of it, you're, you're saying about 15% at least are managers. 
Um, you know, the, the thing is this, if you look at performance, <coughs> yeah. all these managers aren't delivering performance compared to South Lanarkshire. If, if you look at the three constituent colleges that merged, we have less managers now that, from the senior team than, than was originally there. But, but that's not the point. You're yeah, facing... You point about performance, Mr Neal. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the performance, for example, uh, in the outcomes for FE on recognised qualifications <laughs> full-time, New College Lanarkshire, 59.4%. South Lanarkshire College, much smaller college with nothing yeah. like the layers and layers of management you've got, 70.2%. Outcome totals for FE on recognised qualifications part-time, 73% for New College Lanarkshire and 81.4% for South Lanarkshire College. There are other KPIs, but that, that's an example. So my point is this. The environment. If you just let Mr Neil Sorry. finish, Mr McGuire. Right. So, so the two things that, as a parliament, we are interested in here and your management and cost structure and what it's actually achieving. Now, and I realise the, the problems with merger. I think we're all aware of those, but that's now some time away. And obviously what we're talking about and want to concentrate on is the future rather than the past. Okay. So looking to the future, how do you improve your performance and improve your, your cost structure and get more people into teaching and fewer people pain pushing? OK. Dr McTavish. If we look at the two colleges, because they both come under our, our board, South Lanarkshire has, um, in terms of regionalisation, stayed as themselves. They operate from one site in East Kilbride. That is their major site. And in terms of the benefits of regionalisation that we've made together, we've been able to put more resource into South Lanarkshire College in terms of the performance if we look at the performance we recognise in our plan that we're working with um, the funding council that a key measure is in retention of students that's a critical measure for us. If we can retain more students it's a trigger for the other performance measures going up and in this year the the um, statistics are not verified by the Funding Council yet, but indications are that we've improved retention. In terms of the overall results, if we view the total um, background of both sets of students from South Lanarkshire and from New College Lanarkshire, the profile is different. We are taking more from the, the postcodes that have least access into education and that's actually a big thing that I think and maybe Martin could come in and uh, give that, that, you that, further that, information. Mr McGuire, can you address that point briefly and then I'm going to move on yeah, to the yeah, next question. The, the areas of uh, high deprivation that, that New College Lanarkshire is serving is well above what the Scottish average is. Okay, thank you. Mr Neil, I'll come back to yep, you if you have yep, further questions. Yep. Ian Gray. <coughs> um, you, you mentioned there um, I'm not sure, I think it was Dr McTavish mentioned the uh, plan that's been worked on with the Funding Council, and I wanted to ask a little more about that. But prior to that, there was some talk of the impact of national pay bargaining. And one of the points that the Auditor General's report makes um, is that the college didn't budget any contingency for the impact of bargaining, and I'd just like to ask why. Right. Ian Clark. Good morning. Um, the budget you're referring to, Mr Gray, is refers to the 2015-16 budget, uh, which was a particularly challenging budget to achieve. Um, we'd arrived at a point of the budget where we managed to have it balanced and careful consideration was given to the presentation of that budget. I presented it to the Finance Committee as a, as a balanced budget with an overriding cri uh, criteria done in sensitivity analysis that anything else included in this budget would put us into deficit. The Finance Committee were reluctant to increase income targets any further, cut expenditure any further. So it was put in as a, a point of emphasis to the Board of Management in the report that went to the Board of Management to explain that this was a balanced budget, but we had a, a point of emphasis to the Board of Management that any increase for national bargaining uh, would tip us into deficit. The Board made the decision not to present a, balance, uh, a deficit budget they presented a balanced budget, which was heavily caveated by a point of emphasis 
and that was presented to College of Scotland and the Funding Council. So, so, so just to be clear, what you're saying is that the board approved a budget which was balanced, knowing that there was a cost pressure which was inevitably going to fall on it and throw it into deficit, but they decided to ignore that for presentational reasons. That no. doesn't sound like sound budgeting. In terms of the board's involvement and agreement with this, we um, asked our uh, Ian if this was acceptable in the way that we were presenting the information. So in other words, we put in the budget to the funding council with a, a and Ian will give you the technical name, a piece, a point of emphasis, a point of emphasis. and seemingly that is a way forward for you when you're finding it difficult to balance your budget at this time. We also, and I've got the letter with us, this is at the point in time where we are agreeing to national bargaining. And we actually wrote in agreeing that we would take part in national bargaining. And that was in, I think the letter's June 2015. In June 2015, and we point out to the management side, um, that we had difficulties in actually balancing the budget and there was difficulties in terms of the amount of money that we could actually support by our own means without the um, College of Scotland putting cases to government and uh, the funding council of the cost pressures that colleges were under. So... so so the, the Auditor General says that, as it turned out, the cost in that budget year of national bargaining was £400,000. And that, that's not an insignificant factor in creating the financial position which the College is now trying to recover. So can I ask what additional funding the College received from the Scottish Government once national bargaining had reached a, an agreement? The additional funding for national bargaining, and the distinction needs to be drawn between the cost of living elements, which are now nationally negotiated, and the, the harmonisation elements of moving everyone onto the, the one scale. The, the harmonisation elements have been funded by the Scottish Government, um, um, but that kicks in um, later on um, for 2017, 18, 18, 19 and 1920. There's a three-year period um, where the, that, that is phased in. And what that means for Lanarkshire, for example, is that there's going to be a 10% increase um, in funding to Lanarkshire for 1819, which is built up from looking at a large chunk of that built up from looking at what the costs of harmonisation are in the colleges in Lanarkshire and the government fully funding that costs. The subsequent year of that is dependent on the spending review, but we have the costs estimated for that, which will be confirmed later. So the harmonisation element is in effect fully funded. Um, Sorry, just to stop you there. So this £400,000 gap in the budget, is, has that been covered by additional no, that, funding that was, from this, the government this, this, or not? No, this was before the harmonisation element kicked in. This was in a period, and remember this was back in 2015-16 when national bargaining was in its very, very early days. There was an intention to move towards it. The mechanism wasn't fully in place. Um, and colleges were used to setting budgets based on what they could afford for staffing they negotiated locally. Um, they were moving towards a system where it was negotiated nationally and it was harder to predict what the cost of living increase um, would be as part of that. And at that stage, nobody knew what the harmonisation deal would be either because that you know, hadn't then been negotiated. So this was in a period when national bargaining was you know, in its fairly, fairly early days. We can accept that when the budget was set, the college didn't know mm -hmm how much national bargaining would cost. Mm -hmm. But surely it would also be reasonable to say that the assumption that it would cost nothing at all was an unlikely one. So are you saying, Dr Kim, that you accepted from the college a budget which made no provision whatsoever for the national pay bargaining that everybody knew was coming? Yeah, well, let's be cool. we, the budget for the college is a matter for the board, not for the funding council. We get a financial forecast from the college um, which... Um, you know, we, we look at and it's part of our you know, assessment of how well the college is doing and we engage with the college on it. But the approval of the budget is for the board rather than us. 
at that time, I mean, and these financial forecasts have all kinds of assumptions in them, at that time it was very hard to predict where national bargaining would go and whether these, it clearly it wasn't going to be zero. Um, the prediction yeah. that the budget included was well, that it would be zero. With a, with, a, with a heavy caveat, yes. Okay, well, uh, uh, like, can I move to the, the, the business plan? So we're told that um, just over a year ago, May last year, a process was begun of creating a, a business scenario plan between the college and the funding council. And we're also told that that has not been finally agreed, that it's been through, I think, five iterations. So that doesn't sound like a process that we can have much confidence in if it's taken what, 13 months not to reach agreement? Our, our engagement with the college um, on the financial difficulties and then laterally on the business um, plan has been going on for almost two years. Um, and the reason it has taken so long is that you know we've been very keen, and the college has been very keen as well, that we understand exactly what the issues are and come up with a long-term solution that's based on you know, real information um, on what would make a difference, um, rather than just leaping to some kind of balanced budget which produces exactly the kind of problems that we've talked about earlier. So we've been working quite closely with the, the, the college over that time. I would stress, though, that while the business... The, the business scenario plan has not been finally signed off, and we're anticipating that will be done in the next couple of months. Quite a lot of, act of the actions that are within it have already been taken. There have been significant cost savings through a VS, for example, that have already kicked in and the deficit is coming down. So we're keen that when that plan is finalised, it's one that is fully owned by both the college um, and by the funding council, and that the auditors have looked at it and everyone's happy. Um, but we've not been you know, allowing um, the, the search for perfection in that plan to hold up on actually taking some of the actions. OK. In, in the terms of uh, ownership of the plan and everyone being happy, the evidence submitted from uh, the college EIS branch would seem to imply that um, staff, or at least staff representatives of trade unions, don't feel that they've been involved or have ownership of the plan. So perhaps I could ask uh, Mr. Maguire how or uh, how the uh, staff have been involved in developing the iterations of the plan. The, the iterations of the plan, just to, to, to clarify, um, as uh, Mr. Kemp, uh, Dr. Kemp uh, mentioned there, um, it, is, it is misleading to suggest that there, there has not been agreement. There has been no final uh, sign-off. Um, however, uh, there have been stages where there, there has been an authorised VS uh, process and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, there has been uh, engagement with uh, across the college with uh, many managers, for example, uh, and many uh, staff involved in specific areas for calculations and for, for modelling. However, at the stage of going through uh, the uh, the process, there have been many external changes. Uh, we have had to look at, for example, the uh, definition of what funding will be made on an annual basis to then extrapolate over a period of five years. And some of the, the uh, impact assessment, etc., are, are uh, quite significant. So therefore, the, 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 the judgment going forward is to make sure that we get this right. We've worked very, very closely with colleagues of the, the Scottish Funding Council, very, very closely with um, uh, members of the, the Board of Management in iterating and, and, and p taking this uh, uh, forward. But again, the, uh, the final um, um, version of this to be signed off that will be the long-term five-year uh, plan is yet to be, to be finalised. And at certain points where it will be appropriate, then there will be opportunity for uh, uh, wider uh, discussion and consultation. But this is an iterative process which has been going, according to Dr Kemp, for two years, in the course of which a number of actions, for example, more than one voluntary severance scheme have taken place. <clears throat> so surely that negotiation with the wider staff body should have been happening throughout that process. Uh, I would say that the, the, uh, the VS, that there's one VS process Sorry. within that, that, that uh, <coughs> uh, uh, planning uh, element. Um, as far as uh, consultation with, with staff, um, there has been, uh, as, I, as I described there, uh, specific uh, consultation as far as that's concerned. As far from an HR... Sorry, just stop Sorry. you. What you said there yep. was staff had been involved in producing information. Yes. That's not the same as a consultation, consultation. on the plan towards sustainability. Yeah. That's a different thing. 
No, it's, as far as the, the uh, approval <coughs> of a long-term plan, uh, the actual timing of that and the, the ability or the, the appropriateness of the uh, consultation uh, in that timeline hasn't uh, been reached at that so, point. So you're going to finalise the plan with the Board of Management and with the Funding Council and then you're going to talk to staff about it, is that? Well, it, it won't necessarily be that. It'll be an iterative uh, but it's been process. two years of iteration already. Well, w one year as far as the, the uh, business development plan is concerned, although the discussions, uh, as Dr Kemp uh, mentioned, have been uh, uh, longer lying there. But yes, I mean, for example, the, uh, the requirement to align the plan, for example, with the financial forecast return, uh, is now a, a requirement. So therefore, the actual potential sign-off or closing and accuracy of, of that plan must reconcile exactly with that. That uh, deadline is now <coughs> September, so that puts uh, a different time scale in it. Okay. Now, between the, the, the time of now and December, obviously there needs to be a plan of how that, that process of uh, consultation, finalisation will, will take place. So when the staff say they've not been consulted or involved in the process of the development of the plan, that's true? Um, they're in terms of their representatives? In a, in a broad sense, if you're talking about all staff, yeah, and that, 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 the widest possible, yes, okay. at this stage. Mr Smeal, who's in charge, of, um, in charge of relationships with staff and unions and that consultation process? Whose remit does that fall under? Uh, well, normally, primarily, it would be uh, uh, the uh, Vice Principal Organisational Development takes on that. Is that you? No. Who's that? That would uh, normally be... Uh, uh, Brian Gilchrist, who is the uh, uh, Assistant Principal Organisational Development, who takes care of uh, human resource and uh, industrial uh, relations. Okay, so Mr Maguire, as principal, how comfortable are you with the fact that that consultation with staff and unions hasn't happened? I think, um, I think given the complexity of the, of the plan and, and being um, aware of some of the iterations, I think um, there has been a need um, to, for people just to be getting down and, and working on it. And I think once we get to a stage whereby um, it, it, it is ready to go out and be and be evaluated, I think that's the appropriate time. I think I think if we if we kept going back and forward with the, the iterations, because some of them have been quite have been quite complex, particularly the impact assessments on them. Um, I mean, I'll just I'll give you an example. Um, one of the, the things that we were asked to do was look at uh, how we could improve efficiencies in the in the classroom and how we could effectively um, do that in, in our biggest campus, our Motherwell campus. Um, the Motherwell campus was built 10 years ago on a, on a plan that um, had, had smaller uh, room sizes for good pedagogy. Um, now, one of the things that we had to explore then was around how we could maximise efficiencies and effectively um, improve the amount of students that would be uh, in those rooms. You had to consult staff as you're looking at that. Well, the, the first thing that we were required to do was to look at what it would cost actually to... to, to, to um, to maximise the size of the rooms, so we had to. We were required then to go and look at a, a, a capital estate plan, and after that was um, after that had been agreed, um, the funding council at that point said that there would the, that was that was not to be uh, the case, and we would have I'm to. Just, look at I'm just, I'm just quite baffled that this business planning process takes two years, still isn't signed off yet, and at no point along that road has there been a proper consultation done with staff and unions who may have good ideas on cost savings and all the all the things you're looking at are you comfortable with that dr mctavish as chair of the board no it's no. taken two years the two years when john mentioned two years the first year was actually clarifying where we were there was no scenario plans developed in that time and that takes so, a year to work out so in terms of the complexities of the college and the other things that were happening to us in terms of you've, you've um, looked at um, what we looked at in national bargaining, other costs were coming in at that time that we were having to deal with. So in that first year, and we were in contact with the Funding Council at all times in that year, as well as making savings on the ground as we went forward. And that was discussed at Martin's seems, meetings. It seems to me to be moving at a snail's pace, Dr McTavish. Well, Wouldn't you agree? Um, I would love it to be agreed so okay. as we can move forward. We would all love that. What are the barriers to that? The plan has to be um, deliverable 
for everybody, absolutely deliverable. And if we look at past plans that have maybe gone in, um, some of those plans for other parts of the public sector didn't deliver what they were aiming to deliver. So you need more and time on top of the two years to no, make no, it deliverable? It's, I'm, I'm very sorry. I would say we've worked one year in looking at different scenarios. We've looked at um, increasing class uh, room size. But in this, some of the scenarios would have caused the staff major difficulties. And we had to work our way through what actually would be meant by that. And that took a year. Well, the I mean, variations Dr. are Mid quite... We're, we're, it's our job in the Public Audit Committee to follow the public pound and check we're getting value Absolutely. for money. Frankly, what you're telling us today about the pace of this business planning that ultimately is designed to, to bring down your deficit um, and get value for the public purse, frankly, I'm baffled at the timescale that your board has, has taken. I'm going to bring in Liam Kerr. Just... Briefly on the, the point Ian Gray's making um, and, and the points being raised, one of the ways it seems to me that's identified to make the savings is a voluntary severance scheme. I think, Mr Smeal, you said there'd been one as part of this programme. But the, the voluntary severance scheme is happening before this plan has been finalised. And the voluntary severance scheme, by definition, loses staff. It will get, if we, if we like, efficiencies in the system. But... By extension, that puts more pressure on the staff that are remaining. It has a potentially negative impact on the student experience, but you haven't finalised the plan that says why you're doing all of this in the first place. Uh, and haven't even consulted with the staff who are going to be taking voluntary severance as part of this plan so that they understand what's going on and what the ultimate end game is. Is that right? The voluntary severance scheme was about posts and our analysis of the posts that were, that were um, still critical for us. It wasn't about people. No, it was about driving right. efficiencies. It was wasn't driving it? efficiencies. As part of and a in, plan that hasn't been finalised yet. In that, Am I right? In, yes, and in that, it was the first part of the agreement with the Funding Council in going forward to have a voluntary severance. The board, it was reported to the board, it was phase one of where we were going. Can I pass, please, to as, Mr. As part Smale? of a plan that as hasn't been finalised yet and which the conveners pointed out didn't merit full consultation with the actual people who were impacted by this. Is that correct? The, 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 the um, thinking was that when we get further down, full consultation could take place. Some of the scenarios would have been, they are like scenarios looking at if we did this, is it feasible? Those, fees, those things that were being suggested to us were not feasible but and would have caused do you not, problems. Do you not run the risk of doing two years of work and then putting it to the people who are delivering the teaching in your college and they completely reject it? Is it not better to take them along with you as you go? We would always take staff along. So why didn't you consult them throughout this process? We, our view was that we would consult towards the end of the process. Dr Kemp... We may have that very wrong, I accept that. OK. Dr Kemp, is, you, mean you, you oversee yeah. all colleges in Scotland. There will be other colleges that have done similar business planning. Yeah. Is this a reasonable timescale, two years, and is this a reasonable model not to consult as you go? The, the issue of the timing... Um, I mean, ideally, this would have you know, we would have reached an agreed plan more quickly, and th that has happened in some cases. However, there are other examples of of colleges where you know issues have been identified. We've leapt very quickly to a plan, and it's not worked. And a year later, we're back coming up with another one. So we were keen that that didn't happen, and we've learned some of the, the lessons from Edinburgh College, which you know was the other section twenty two you considered um, a few weeks ago, which is you know on a successful trajectory. Um, and the important and the part of the reason that that one um, has been so successful is we did spend some time, not as not as much time as this, um, but we did spend some time getting an agreed plan so that the funding council and the college were in exactly the same place, and we got auditors to check the plan so that we weren't going back six months into it. Everyone saying, "Well, that isn't what I, I thought we'd agreed," because we had actually been there previously with Edinburgh. So we were concerned that 
it was important to get an agreed plan. The issue of whether elements of it were implemented before it was finally agreed, that comes back to your point about urgency. There was a, you know, a very significant deficit in the college. That is already coming down as a result of some of the actions that have been taken as part of the plan, um, or the, the, you know, the, the not fully um, agreed plan. But that, I think that's important that we did that, so that we weren't just waiting for two years while the situation got worse. Ian Gray. I just wanted to pick up on the point you made there, Dr Kent, that all of this that we're discussing is because of the, the college's financial position and the deficit which they're trying to resolve to create yeah. financial sustainability. An alternative explanation from all the others that we're exploring, of course, would be that the college simply doesn't have enough money to do its job, and that comes down to the funding council. So can I ask how you decide and how confident you are yeah. that the allocation that's been made to the college is correct and adequate. Yeah. We fund colleges um, on the basis of credits, on the amount of activity they do, and we pay a particular amount yeah. per credit. We take into account rurality, deprivation, um, and a few other premiums as well. But we essentially fund all colleges on the same basis, for the same amount of activity, we will fund. So we are not funding on the size of their deficit. We are funding on the basis of what they deliver. So, the college we're discussing serves. We've already heard areas of significant yeah. deprivation, and I, yeah. I think, if my geography serves me correctly, some quite rural areas as yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. So, are you satisfied that that's reflected in the allocation that the college receives? I think every single college in Scotland, whether to ask whether the funding was adequate, would argue that it probably isn't. But they're all funded on the same basis. Um, and we have to do that in, in, a, in a fair way. Now, for the next couple of years, as national bargaining is implemented, we will be moving to a system of funding the cost of national bargaining. But we will need to transition back to one that's based simply funding on volume of activity. In the case of, um, of Lanarkshire, um, we are fairly confident that we are funding them fairly and on the same basis as every other college. We are open to discussion on some of these issues. And in the case of um, New College Lanarkshire, that the way that it, what used to be called extended learning support, now called access and inclusion funding, was being used in the college. We did vary the amount upwards by, I think, 750,000 quite recently, because you know, we'd looked at what they were doing and how we were funding it. But the, the key point is we fund colleges on the same basis wherever they are, taking account of rurality and other things, and New College Lanarkshire is fund on funded on the same basis as every other college in Scotland. Willie Coffey. Um, I want to pick, pick up some of the issues in the way the Visit Internal Audit Report, but, but, but firstly I wanted to ask Dr Kemp just to clarify something you said earlier about the harmonisation provision. Uh, you said the harmonisation elements were funded by the Scottish Government. Does that apply to all the colleges in Scotland? Yes, yeah. We have worked with Colleges Scotland to identify um, what the costs of moving from what each college's individual position is with wages, hours, holidays and so on. Um, and over the transition period, um, and we are now it, we're heading into year two, um, we have put in the funding and year one is identified for year two. Year three is dependent on the spending review. Every college in Scotland got a harmonisation uplift to, to, yes. to, to pay for the harmonisation salaries that they were, they were facing yes. before their mergers. No, no, not before. No, no. This is the national bargaining harmonisation that's happening at the moment. Um, the, the, there was regional harmonisation in some places as part of the mergers. That's a different process. Ah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Were all colleges funded to meet that cost? No, there was some colleges were given some funding as part of the merger process, but that wasn't long-term funding in the way that the, the national bargaining funding is at the moment. Yeah. Really harmonised at the point of merger because that was important that the staff who were working with us received the same salary that we did that locally and we met the costs of that ourselves. Right, okay. Can I turn to the, the Wiley Bissett internal yes. audit to report? I mean, it, it's quite a damning report, isn't it? It's a very damning report. Um, when we were, as the Board of Management, um, finding out and getting reports of the information that was coming in, this is post-merger, this was not discovered by auditors, but it was us getting letters or writs on us, etc., etc. 
And at the <coughs> audit committee of the board, we determined it was likely better to get an overview of this. And we wondered, well, why was this not in the due diligence reports that we received just prior to the merger of Coatbridge with New College Lanarkshire? We were very disappointed that it wasn't in because less cash came with the merger too, Mr Coffey, and there were these extra costs that started to identify. Costs that, when you add them up, are very, very considerable. But can I pass over to our principal, and he can speak a wee bit further about them? Questions? I'm sorry, Mr. Coffey. That's all right. Uh, I mean. What it says in the internal audit report there that there was a budget forecast of a surplus of £21,000, which turned into a deficit of a million, despite despite an injection of cash by the Funding Council of nearly a million pounds. And some of the issues that are raised in the audit report, for example, there's an ERDF clawback mentioned as well that cost you over £200,000. There was a failure to provide funds to manage the end of the lease arrangement for Dewart House. It cost you £88,000. There was a failure to even know what the terms of the exit conditions were in the lease for the property. There was a failure to manage the contract renewal process at the Green Hills Industrial Estate Complex. The contract specified that there was termination conditions and renovations required, but it was not provided for. It cost you another £75,000. There was a mention in the audit report of a relationship with Chinese universities that was described as financially disastrous. <laughs> in this audit report, and not to mention the excessive exceptional staff costs that were forecast to be 300,000 quid, which turned out to be 1.7 million. This is an absolute catalogue of disaster. So why does it take an internal audit function to find this kind of stuff out that you guys should already be aware of in the management of the whole college? Because it wasn't identified at due diligence. I'm this is this is purely to in relation to Coat Bridge College coming into yeah. the merger. That this, this was this was not identified as, as through the due diligence process. So all these all these managers and layers that Alec Neil mentioned earlier there, nobody knew any of this was going on. Mr. McLaughlin did process. Uh, Scott McCreef, I think, was there. Yeah, Ian Ian Clark. Did the financial due diligence and Anderson Strathairn did the legal due diligence. Alex Neil. I could get that information to you. Can you send it to us? Because yes. I mean, clearly, if they if they were given the mistakes they made, you should be claiming your money back from them. Dr. McTavish. We actually tried to do that. Um, what we've not given you was the due diligence report that we got at the point that Coke Bridge came into the college. That's not the report that you're looking at. This is a thing that happened when we were into the merger. One of the difficulties, and you see it, and one of the reasons why we decided to do this, it was to get a complete record. It was in this year, a 2015, where we were trying to drill down and understand all the finances and see where we could make savings. Like the students who were, and I know that you're very interested, and we all are passionately interested in the quality of learning and teaching. If we looked at what, where the motor vehicle students were, you wouldn't wish students to be learning there when you had other students in great facilities. So it was about getting them in. Okay. Okay. When we took away the leases, it meant that more money could go back straight okay. in to the... the yearly budget of the college. Thank you. Mr Coffey. I do appreciate that, Dr McTavish, but, but fundamentally, I mean, to not even be aware of or know the impact of exit clauses at the end of lease arrangements for properties and premises, it's just astonishing. Because, I mean, it's, it's a standard business practice that if you leave a premise, you, there's always a condition in the lease that, that asks you to make good any repairs, and so it's quite common. But for this to be recurring through this audit report, it's quite astonishing that nobody knew that, and it was only flagged up by the internal audit report here. I mean, management should should know this, surely, to goodness. To be fair, I think the reason, I think the reason that the internal audit report was sought was management were becoming aware of these and wanted to 
have it all clarified in this report. And the issue is whether, you know, at the time of the merger, it was clear enough in what was reported by Coke Bridge. John, you, say, you said earlier as well that the Funding Council's role is not to oversee the reports and financial plans and so on, but surely to goodness there's, there has to be an engagement with the funding. You mean you're throwing money at this yeah. here. It's a college that, that buried its head in the sand in terms of reporting the, the staff costs that were required. We've heard that earlier and you, you gave them another million pounds to, to address that. Surely that means you've, you've got an interest and you must look in detail and depth at at the plans that the college have. Oh in yeah, place. But let this be clear. At the time of merger, we were working very closely um, with you know, the, what was then the, the three separate colleges, um, and you know, th this committee um, or its predecessor has already considered some of the issues there were about Coke Bridge's entry into that merger and how difficult it was. And, and what you're seeing here is a, is a reflection of that. But you, you, you say, say that you're, you're giving them another 10% for Lanarkshire in 1819. You know, having a wee, you're scrutinising what their plans are to suit to make sure that that's a justifiable award. Yeah. Did, well, did they just ask for the money and you give them no, it? No, 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 let's be clear, that is not the way it works. So that, that was my point. Well, we have you do done not any fund diligence in there? No, the, the, increase, Dr. The, the increase in funding to Lanarkshire is not based on the, the business plan or the deficit. It is based on the fact that the cost of national bargaining um, will account for a large chunk of that, and there's also some increases in childcare, um, that's, that's some increases in various um, you know, bits of provision, and there's a, an uplift in the unit of resource for all colleges. So that increase of about 10% in funding to Lanarkshire is not based on the business transformation plan, it's based on um, you know, a normal funding method plus the additional for national bargaining. Okay. Okay. I'll let other colleagues come in. Convener. Bill Bowman. Yeah. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, just going back to more general matters. I, I don't know if I've seen a, a formalised response to the Auditor General's report from you. you. You've given us some papers today. One head of human resources. One new college Lanarkshire. One selection of learning and teaching highlights, and the um, and the internal audit report. C can you tell me? What is the status of these documents? I mean, I, they seem to have arrived to us, but I, I don't know, you know, what particular points you're making on them. Well, we selected some documents for you to give you further information about what we were doing and also looking at the transcript, some of the areas that you were interested in. Um, we, we, and I apologise if we've not actually produced a paper that you were expecting from us, which is a response, and we can do that, a response to the section 22. I, I'm not asking for that specifically. I was wondering, first of all, if you'd had a response, because it's, you know, as a, a board or as a, a college, I presume you would have a, a reaction to it, whether you agreed, disagreed. I mean, the information well, in here, is this all information that's already been made available to the Auditor General? The information we've sent to you, we had never released the um, due diligence report to anyone. It's come to you. It's been redacted because we had to check that um, legally it was okay to put it in. The paper in relation to um, the impact of national bargaining on the staffing was written as an analysis of what, um, what, what had happened and also an analysis of who had taken up the offer of voluntary severance because there was some, um, uh, you had some debate about whether there were, um, it was all teachers that was going. And I think we've let you see who actually was going. And in the period that we've been in New College Lanarkshire, we've actually increased the amount of teaching staff that we've got. So we've tried to select some papers to get, does that, yes, um, to help yes, you? Thank you. So, Bill Bowman. So thank you. Um, well, I think it would be helpful, or it would have been helpful, just to see exactly what you were responding to. I'm sure it's to you know valid valid points. Although I didn't realise the um, the internal audit report was this was the first time it had had surfaced, and um, reference to the due diligence report, which I think has been teased out here, uh, might be interesting for the auditor general to have sight of those and to give a reaction to that because it seems a fairly serious matter. I, if these reports were shared with the Auditor General? Do we know? 
Dr McTavish, you're shaking your head. Is that the what audit they, you report, don't know or the, they weren't the sure? Audit I'm sorry, convener. No. The audit Take report your time. was shared with the audit committee of the college. Okay. Right? Okay. And in the discussions with the funding council and with the auditor general, there was thinking that the um, your view of the old Coatbridge College was complete with your other work. Mm -hmm. And what I said was that was only part of the story. Because we weren't, we had to start the college to make it better and we didn't always want to go back. But it was to let you see the volume of stuff okay. that, that came in. And you did have discussion at your session about the extra costs that we faced when Coatbridge College came in that had not been identified in due, dil due diligence report at the time okay. we merged. Thank you. Is that so, Mr Maguire, can you add to that briefly? Or? I'm sure that um, Audit Scotland are aware of that report because some of the, the, the quotes in the last um, yeah. transaction, okay. they, did, they did refer to some of the, the issues in it, so I'm pretty sure that they've had it. OK, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they probably Are you referring are. to the Coatbridge report? Or yes. To? Yes, OK, well, we can perhaps check that. Yep. Thank in, you. In due course. Thank you, Mr Bowman. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. Yes, sir. <coughs> Thank you, convener. I mean, page 17 of the annual audit report considers performance management and says, and I quote, overall student outcomes identify a mixed picture and in some areas remain a cause for concern. For example, a percentage of further education students enrol in full-time recognised qualifications has shown a downward trend for early and further withdrawals over the three-year uh, period and in addition, the 2016-17 early and further withdrawal rates have continued to increase and remain higher than the national average. So why is that? And I would ask also the funding council, given the fact that the, you made it clear that um, you know the funding uh, relies on outcomes uh, and credits. What impact that's likely to have on the on the further uh, sustainability of the college? Yeah. The, um Firstly, on the financial impact, clearly um, we pay for students um, that are retained, um, we, we, so they'd have to stay for 20 So if you've got an early dropout rate problem, then that will affect um, your funding from us because there won't be credits you can claim. Um, so clearly, if, if a college has a, a significant issue with, with early retention, that, that does affect the income to the college. So more importantly than that, though, um, what we want um, through our outcome agreements with colleges and with regions is to make sure that they are adequately serving that region and that the students have been well served and are completing successfully. We are aware that your know, new, co new college Lanarkshire you know, has had an issue with this and, and the college you know, is aware of that and has been addressing it. It's been part of the government's Im improvement programme on retention and you know, as, as Linda said earlier, the early indications on that are that it is improving things. So this is you know, very much one of the issues that will be part of the discussion between the Funding Council and, and Lanarkshire as part of the outcome agreement um, arrangements. It does have an impact financially in that you, know, you won't get funded for students who are not there. But the, the key thing about this is it's about serving students well and making sure they are successful. So that's why we push that in the outcome agreement. Could, could I maybe say the culture has grown? Um, it's been one of the few colleges that has grown, and um, that's part of the, the widening access agenda. And as I was saying earlier on, we're serving uh, areas of high deprivation, so so we're actually attracting more students who are furthest removed from FE. That that makes it harder to retain. Now, the simple thing to do would have not have been to grow, and, and not to take those those students because that would have that would have increased or, or at least helped our PIs. But the right thing to do is to, is to work with those students and work in those areas of high deprivation. So, so with that comes comes a challenge, um, and that's a challenge that, that we're up for making and we're starting to make inroads to. But but it's really really important that we understand the, the, the environment that the, the college is working in. Yeah, I mean I think if we do understand that uh, perfectly uh, well, I mean, uh, but if we actually look at what, for example, EIS and Feller are saying, they're saying that the impact of the financial difficulties on the daily operations created an extremely stressful working environment and has led to strange, strange relationships at all levels. Teaching workloads are unmanageable and conflicts arise daily over job roles and related tasks. 
uh, staff absences often due to stress related illness can lead to further stress in remaining staff and they've also said that uh, you've consistently Mr Maguire refused to provide any details of the deficit um, which would show in the accounts for 2016 or 17 and the budget for 2017-18 so one of the reasons why uh, there might be a reduction in outcomes and therefore the ability of the college to attract funding for its credits is because uh, of this financial uh, situation we're in and the impact on staff morale, not just uh, the deprivation in relation to the areas in which you recruit your students from. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, morale is um, affected. There's no doubt about it. I think um, there's, there's a whole load of rumours going about about the campuses closing and whatever. Um, you know, and I had to put a, an email out last week to assure staff that there were no campus closures. So, so I think there is there is a fear um, among staff when when colleges get into deficit um, and they look at other organisations that are looking at compulsory redundancy and whatever. So we've tried to assure staff that that certainly won't be the case in our, our situation. And I think it's also important to remember that um, the deficit has come down um, to less than one percent of of turnover. And I think that's 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 important that, we, that that whilst the half a million deficit is not anything that we would want, um, it has been a marked improvement. Um, as far as um, workload is concerned, um, yeah, I, I think right across the board in, 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 a, in a merged college um, where staff have left, we we have now have lost about 130 staff, and workloads have increased right across the board. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, so it is about it is about communicating. It is about trying to keep people. Motivated, but it's it's been very very difficult. And one of the other factors around um, motivation and morale um, going down has, has been around uh, national bargaining as well. Um, we um, we have seen um, strikes in, in the sector for the first time in 20 years, and that has caused division in staff rooms. There's no doubt about it, because some staff went out and some didn't go out, and and that that's a, that that becomes a long a long term difficulty among staff. So it's, it's, it's a difficult environment that the sector's in at the moment. It's a difficult environment when we have a, a model um, whereby we have, through the Employers Association, um, we have uh, a system whereby a cost of living rise is agreed, um, and then whether we can afford it or not, we have to find the money for it. And that's a difficult environment to be in because at the moment, um, when we're looking to cut costs, 70% of our costs are, are wage-related costs. Um, and the other 30%, I think, have pretty much cut to the bone. So, um, so the only other option is to start to look at how we how we cut um, and save on staff-related costs. And that, yeah. But, but, yeah, thanks, convener. But, but Mr. Maguire, a lot a lot of what we've talked about this morning it seems to be about about things like, for example, the lack of consultation, the fail to take staff with you, you the 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 fact that people, you know, as, as Dr. McTavy said, oh, we'll we'll talk to folk once we've actually agreed the plan, so to speak. And yet, what they're actually what fell in EIS are actually mm -hmm. saying is there were concerns about the level of consultation in relation to proposed new structure. And they go on to say there's a perception now among academic staff that faculty and management are not interested in staff and that the, the curriculum and quality leadership position is a buffer between lecturing staff and management. Now, how are you going to get the best possible outcomes for your students if you have that kind of relationship actually in the college? Surely that must be impacting on your outcomes and those outcomes uh, lead to credit, lead to um, you know, increased yeah, I, I, uh, I, I agree in silo. I think you know, um, I mean, I've, I've said all along that, you know, Happy staff, staff that are content, staff that are secure, um, make for for good students. Um, and you know, I've, I've been a principal for twelve years and appointed in four different colleges, so mm -hmm. I know I know what it means to to, to, to have good staff relationships. Um, and I know I know that at the minute it, it is difficult, um, but there are a whole load of circumstances that are making that difficult. Mr. McGuire, you said in your previous answer to Mr. Gibson, you find it difficult to motivate staff. Why is that? I, I think I think for some staff at the minute, um, it doesn't matter how many times I'll tell them that there will be no compulsory redundancies, um, that no campuses are closing. I think there is a rumour mill. I think there are people who are actively seeking to to to, to do um, damage within the organisation and upset people. Um, and I think that that culture um, is difficult. And I think that's something that we're seeing right across the sector just now because of the the turmoil and the churn and the change that's happening. I think there's no doubt about that. Okay. Mr Gibson. 
Yeah, as you can see, the, the, the Scottish Funding Council provided advanced funding of 1.9 million to the college in July, July of last year, in condition that the college develop a business scenario plan. Is that something that the college, that the Scottish Funding Council, does routinely? It makes advances mm -hmm. of that scale. No, that would be that would be quite unusual. We have done it in the past. Um, you know, as a way of smoothing um, cash flow in colleges. It's a, it's a fairly unusual um, step, and it was clearly as part of our engagement w with the college on you know, creating a plan that would help them you know, get into a better place. And, and then the criteria in which that money was advanced, have it been fulfilled? Um, well, the, the advance was until the end of this um, academic year. We are currently... Um, Oh, you're shaking your head. Yes. The advance was paid back in one month. Uh -huh. It was a cash flow. Um, and Ian maybe can uh, further, but it was paid back within one month. So mm -hmm. it's it's not like what, we weren't given that money. To right. Um, Is okay. that all right? Yes, indeed. Just, just for clarity, we, re we received 1.9 million from the Funding Council on July the 19th, 2017, as an advance of a 17-18 grant so in effect with no liability within 13 days okay thank you yeah, clearly the, the the scale of which we we assist the college with cash flow will need to be resolved as part of finalizing the business plan um there is you know a continuing um need to, to help the college with cash flow and we will do that um, we welcome our your scrutiny and also the board scrutiny and senior management scrutiny and the staff scrutiny of the PIs. The PIs are part and parcel of where we can make improvements, especially in the key one of retention. If you look at your table, that's got the strongest pink um, in the table. In terms of positive destination, and I contacted um, Audit Scotland, one of the reasons why... Um, Dr McTavish, I'm not sure this directly answers oh, Ken Kenneth Gibson's question. Sorry. Just one final Mr. point, Gibson. convener, because you, you've given me a, a lot of leeway and I appreciate that. What would have happened if you hadn't advanced this £1.9 million? The college would have been in a very serious cash position that dropped to the college there. Dr Kemp, can you move your microphone slightly closer oh, to sorry. you? Yeah, yeah, just so we can catch... Yeah. See if you can yeah. say that again. Yeah, um, clearly the college would have been in a very serious cash position at that time um, had we not done it, and that's just why we did it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Alex Neil. Can I ask Martin, in, in answer to your last answer to Kenny Gibson, you said that there were people within the college who are deliberately undermining the college, or what's to that effect? What evidence do you have for that? Well, I think... Um, well, I think if, if people are putting rumours out that we're, that we're closing campuses in, in spite of the fact that I continually say that we're not, then somebody's obviously starting those rumours. But but that sounded more serious. It sounded as though there was more of a an organised um, well, undermining I mean, of the college. Well, I mean, it was a pretty incendiary statement you made, well, to be honest, I, Martin. I can only draw that conclusion, though, Alec. If I continue to say to people we are not closing campuses, we are not reducing the amount of faculties, and still those rumours exist and still people say that that's happening then somebody must be making it up and somebody must be putting it out there. I think, we, I, think, I think there's a big jump from saying somebody is engaging in rumour mongering to saying they're um, deliberately undermining the college. Well, I think that does because it creates real anxiety, right. it creates real worry, it creates stress in the, in the staff rooms, it absolutely does. And, it, and it's very, very difficult. And could that not be a symptom of the kind of industrial relations situation that's been described here in the written evidence we have from the unions, where basically well, they're saying you, you're you refusing to to involve that, them? That, well, let, let me finish. Sorry, you, the, the, I mean, some of, the, some of what they're saying, as Kenny Gibson's already pointed out, yeah. I mean, just take one sentence. Mm -hmm. Many staff have little confidence that the organisation will get any better and do not feel valued. Now, despite all these layers of management, um, this this is not uh, looking like a well-managed college yeah. when the workers are feeling like that. Now, this is both the EIS and the um, Further Education Lecturers Association. And clearly, from the evidence from the union side, there is a clear message here that people are not being involved. You've already admitted, Linda's already admitted, you, that you have not involved the staff in any meaningful way in the business development planning process. No wonder they feel alienated. If they're not being informed and not involved, it's no wonder rumours start, surely. Yeah, I mean, 
Again, I think you're taking it from one perspective there. And, no, I'm asking a question. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we do communicate, we do meet on a regular basis with, with the trade unions um, b through formal GNCs, through the partnership committees that we have, and in informal meetings as well to, dis to, to take them through particular issues. But I'll give you an example. There was a, a partnership meeting um, last week on communication. Um, the support staff union were there, but EIS didn't turn up. So why I mean, I mean, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of one particular yeah. meeting. But, no, but you're, but clearly, you're talking about opportunities let, for people let, to engage. Yeah, yeah. Let, yeah. Let, let me rephrase it. What what are you going to do at board level to address this very serious problem? I mean, staff morale you've already said is low. Yeah. You've already admitted you don't involve them in the business your staff in the business development process, etc., etc., etc. I mean, you've more or less agreed in some respects, or given certainly credence to and validity to the points being made in the evidence well, from the trade union need, side. So what are you going yeah, to do what about we need, it? What we need is a secure, sustainable funding model for the college moving forward. That's what we need. That will bring security. If people know that their jobs are safe, then they will start to feel secure, and that that is that is the most that is the most difficult thing for staff at the moment because they don't feel secure within their jobs, and 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 that is that is a daily that is a daily occurrence that that is happening, and that is why as John Kemp says, we need to get this business plan done and dusted quickly, put to bed, and get back to focusing on taking the college forward, and that is about teaching and learning and skills and skills development. But it's a basic. It's a basic in any organisation that for a business plan to be successful, yep. it has to, from conception right through to execution, has to involve the people who have to make it successful. You've said you're not doing that. So how are you going to involve the ordinary lecturer, <coughs> the ordinary CNAQ leader, and so on, with all these layers of management? How are you going to involve these people in the business planning process, because if you don't do that, the rumours will continue, yep. the dissatisfaction and low morale will continue, and it might be the business, best business plan financially in the world, but it will not be successful because the people who are expected to deliver it haven't been involved in it and therefore don't feel ownership of it. It's a basic of any management organisation that you involve people okay. in these decisions. Mr Maguire. Yeah, I think you know we're getting to the stage now where the, the, hopefully we'll get to the, the, the final um, draft so solution that will then go to, to the board. We'll go for a wider con consultation. Too late. We'll go to our too late. The final draft is far too late, Martin. You have to surely involve staff before you finalise your draft. That's the lesson. Yeah, I, I, I think as, as Derek was saying, though, there have staff have been involved at various levels to provide some of the scenarios. The, the, well, I'll be quite, quite honest basic. with you. Some of the impact assessments that we've had to produce as, as, as part of this have not been palatable, um, and they would have actually have, have I think, um, increased um, you know rumours and, and would have upset staff even more. So, so I think you know it's it's not been done to, to try and keep things from people. It's been done because we've been exploring what what the issues are. Mr. McGuire, when is the final? Iteration draft, whatever of this well, business plan, going we, to be ready. We met in May um, with the funding council, and, and, and we felt that, that we were at the point where it was pretty much done and dusted. Um, and at that point, there was there was an agreement that we would wait for the FFR guidance to come out. Um, that came out the week before last, so that has now been put, plugged into the plan. So hopefully, we're pretty much at a point where we can present um, a, a plan that has been worked right. through. But when? What's the date for that? Is it? The deadline is, is the end of September. But obviously, we are in the, the midst of that. Drafts will be a, available uh, uh, a significant time before that. Right. And so, Mr Maguire, as I understand in your answer to Mr Neil, what you're saying is staff morale is low because they're worried about money and you need a sustainable funding settlement. Yeah. Dr Kemp, is, is more, are, are you saying, Mr Maguire, that if you get more money, then staff will be happy? I think if people uh, no, I don't think money makes people. Well, but that's what you said in no, response think, to Mr. Neil. I think I think if we can get a sustainable model for the college moving forward, then yeah, that, absolutely. But but to give staff, are you talking about giving staff more money or the college more money? No, so, you said yeah. that when when a funding solution yes. is in place, then staff will feel more secure. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're thinking that'll come off off the back of this business plan? Absolutely. Right, yeah. Dr. Kemp. Yeah. 
Yeah, my, my understanding of what Martin said was a sustainable funding model for the college, meaning the business plan. Because yeah. um, sustainable funding for the college is, is delivered through the, the fairly significant increase in funding um, you know, that will be going in 18, 19, and that, you know, depending on future spending reviews, will be continued. The issue is how that is translated into something that works in the college and can demonstrate you know, a balanced budget going forward. OK, so if we call you, ask you back to committee later in the year, we expect that that business plan will be ready? I, I would anticipate that yeah. business plan yeah. will be ready um, you know, soon after the recess is finished. Um, okay. OK, Liam Kerr. Thank you. Just a few things to to check back on. First of all, um, the Coatbridge College business that we're looking at, and you were asked by Willie Coffey about the due diligence. Um, can I just confirm for the record? So Scott Moncrief and Anderson Strathairn were the professional advisors on that, uh, and they produced due diligence reports, uh, which didn't pick up around a million pounds worth of liabilities. Is that correct? Is my understanding correct? Do you want, I'll tell you. In terms of the financial accounts of Coatbridge College. They were only completed in March 2015. At the creation of the business plan for merger, the Coatbridge College presentation was that they'd make a break-even budget or so of about £21,000 surplus. When we finished the accounts in March 2015, a full year later, we discovered a £1 million deficit over an eight-month period, which extrapolated goes to £1.5 million. So at the time, I don't think that Scott McKeith would, would, under, would, would estimate that there would be a deficit of such a, an occurrence because at the time that they were given this information and carried out their due diligence, there was only a forecast that was provided by Cope Ridge College. The accounts came and were presented a year later. <clears throat> if I could just press you on that, Mr Clark. Yep. Who dropped the ball? Who missed a million pounds worth of liabilities? Because earlier on, it seemed to be Scott Moncrief and Anderson Strathairn. Uh, uh, are you now saying it was actually Coatbridge College or someone else, or who, who at your end missed it? Well, I would say that the, the Coatbridge College accounts were not completed until March 2015, by which time there was a full understanding of the position of Coatbridge. So at the time, the due diligence was carried on and carried out in 2013-14, and the information provided to, in this, this case, Scott McCreef would be based upon what was their budget, because the financial year figures had not yet been finished. It was uh, I understand the Coatbridge principal and board at the time were not completely sold on the idea of a merger, uh, and there was a great deal of prevarication. Uh, would that have had an impact on the uh, diligence that was done? No, I don't, well, <clears throat> I don't think so, because it's a process that you would look at. When we took up the issue with the auditors who had carried out the original due diligence, they said that they can only put in the reports what's actually highlighted to them. And that information didn't come from Cope Bridge at that time. So it was Cope Bridge that's what, who that's failed to provide the information. So the due diligence reports that you will have paid for, a significant amount of money, didn't ask the questions, but they would say, we weren't given the information by the seller, effectively. And that's what they say, and our audit committee even challenged that. Mm -hmm. there was because, as you say, we were concerned about the costs of all of these due diligence reports, mm -hmm. the accuracy of the due diligence reports, but also the impact of these extra costs in the business model for the new college going forward. Mm -hmm. I might come back to that, just, but I do want to examine. I, there was a part of the Section 22 report that talked about uh, during 2015-16, the college tried to manage its cash flow problems. It delayed payments to creditors and sought to receive quicker payments from debtors. Uh, now, that, to me, is extremely poor practice. And it, it, as I understand it, goes against everything that the Scottish Government uh, says is is appropriate. So who took that decision? Mr Clark? Yeah. The college, just in terms of clarity, what the college did was previous to January 2017, we're completing payment runs to suppliers twice a month. We moved from January 17 to one payment a month, which was consistent with this SFC 
drawdown period and still consistent with our policy of standard 30 days. Because there was no change to the policy, we're working within an existing policy. That was a decision for the senior finance team. Um, it's not referred to the board of management under the scheme of delegation. And as can be seen from the accounts, our standard creditor days are nine days. The average in the sector is 22, the highest being six, and the, the lowest being 39. So we sit quite comfortably within that framework, our average payment days of nine. Understand, the, the Auditor General's report says it, the, the college delayed payments to creditors. So, but what that, that, you're telling me, Mr. That, Clark, is that that's that's not that's semantics. Actually, yep. you didn't delay payments to creditors. We moved from two payment runs a month to one, basically from January 17. So we still stayed within the 30 days. The auditors audited their accounts and they audited their creditor days. It's been nine days as well. So we don't we don't have any issues in terms of um, <coughs> delaying payments deliberately to suppliers. We just simply moved from two credit runs a month to one. So, uh, okay, I understand. So for the avoidance of doubt, there's yeah. nothing to see here, is what no, you're telling me. No. Um, where, what other options did you consider to manage the cash flow? Basically, it was only working, working uh, cash management we had to do at that time. So we did try and speak with our debtors um, to ensure that they, could, they would pay us on time. And we had some, some debtors, large-scale debtors, we did ask if there was any chance of getting paid early, um, which was often not the case of they would say yes to that. Okay. So it, it became... Mr Maguire, you said in your answer to Mr Neil that there are troublemakers amongst your staff. I was uh, very concerned uh, by that statement and the relationships that you will have to foster to take the college forward in difficult times. Are you really in a position to take staff forward and to take the college forward? Yeah, I think I am. And I think, um, I think that, that some of the angst... Um, I, I think there'll be people watching this just now that'll be quite happy that I've said that because I think... A lot of staff are getting fed up with the constant rumours and the constant undermining that's happening there. So, um, yeah, a a absolutely. Um, but I do think that what we need to do is to get um, a solid, sustainable financial model for the sector moving forward and for our college in particular. OK. Can I thank you all very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now close the public session of the committee. <laughs>